because I am not here, to uh, uh, prevent being intoxicated, and it has some adaptive value. So it prevents ingesting toxic food, but also food, food that has been uh, found by a microorganism. And such reactions are innate. You don't need to learn. You can learn to avoid some food, but it's innate. Uh, if you uh, present a bitter uh, molecule to a baby, uh, it has a reaction of rejection. So it's innate. And it's found in all animals. So when you see this, uh, when you look at the literature on uh, uh, bitterness, uh, Many papers start by saying, okay, bitterness helps animals to uh, avoid being intoxicated. And it suggests that there is a relation between toxicity and bitterness. So if there is a relation, so a highly uh, a bitter molecule uh, should be highly toxic and a, high, and a less bitter molecule uh, should not be toxic. So this is something that you can test experimentally. And the second assumption, underlying assumption, is that there might be uh, an opposite relation between detoxification and, and uh, sensory detection. If you take a molecule uh, belonging to, that is uh, detoxified, detoxified, sorry, uh, it means that if you encounter food with this molecule, you will not be intoxicated. So you don't need to detect this molecule. So actually, if you are well defended against a toxicant, you don't need a sensory detection. And so it should not be bitter. And, opposite, uh, and in the opposite way, if you are well equipped to detect a molecule at very low concentration, you, you don't eat toxic food, so you don't need to detoxify. So your uh, genes are used to detoxify the molecules are not used. So it should be some relation between these two uh, sensory space or, or spaces, okay? Let's look now at the taste system. How taste neurons are detecting uh, taste things. So in insects, there is a whole range of uh, receptors which are expressed at the surface of the membrane of taste neurons. We will concentrate on the uh, uh, GR, gustatory receptors. In Drosophila, there is a family of about 60 receptors expressed in uh, these neurons. But there are also other uh, uh, membrane receptors expressed at, the, at this membrane. One is the family of ionotropic receptors. There are uh, 66 of them. And uh, they are used, they are expressed both in uh, olfactory receptor, uh, olfactory neurons and gustatory neurons. Some of them are involved in the detection of pheromones, others are involved in the detection of salt, lipids, or maybe they act also as cofactors. And there are also uh, other uh, uh, membrane receptors which are dealing with the detection of ions. Uh, the latest uh, finding is that optins are involved in taste in Drosophila, as well as autopetrin. And I, I think that the more we will look, the more we will search, the more uh, receptors we will find in uh, gustatory neuron. So these are cells which interact with molecules coming from the outside. And we will concentrate now on gustatory receptors. So let's look at how these gustatory receptors are expressed in uh, neurons. There is a seminar work uh, done by uh, Linnea Weiss in 2011, which demonstrates this very nicely. First on this graph, you see different uh, 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 six type of uh, taste sensilla called L, S, and I, and there are subtypes. L is for long hairs, S is for small hairs, and I is for intermediate length uh, hairs. And what you see is that in these uh, hairs, there are a different number of uh, taste neurons. 
Usually there are four taste neurons and one mechanoreceptor. And some of these pairs have only two neurons. And what you see on this graphic is that some neurons are labeled B and others are labeled S. B stands for bitter, S for sugar. So sugar sensitive neurons are expressing GRs. And you see that they are expressing three to, uh, two to three or four uh, GR. So these GRs have numbers. Actually in Drosophila, there are nine gustatory receptors tuned to sugars. We have one gustatory receptor tuned to sugar. And the B neurons, bitter sensitive neurons, they express another group of uh, gustatory receptors. And you see that one neuron can express up to 20 gustatory receptors. So each neuron is expressing a mosaic of gustatory receptors. And these gustatory receptors are tuned to molecules which belong to a different sensory space. So a neuron responding to sugar will express GR5A, GR6A, uh, uh, B, C, D, E, et cetera. And it will not express gustatory receptors which are interacting with bitter uh, uh, molecule. And on the opposite, bitter sensitive neurons will not detect sugar. So there is a, 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 a stru structure in, in the way the taste system uh, which means that um, the biological significance of a molecule coming from the outside is already determined by the neuron itself. You don't need a brain to know if it's a good substance or a bad substance. You just need to look at one neuron. In olfaction, it's completely different. You have a combinatorial interaction uh, each neuron is expressing only one receptor. In taste, one neuron is expressing a mosaic of receptors. So in order to, to, to look at this, uh, we can imagine a, 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 an experiment where we use one of these gustatory receptors to kill the cell expressing uh, these, uh, this receptor. So for example, if we go back, uh, all uh, bitter sensitive neurons are expressing a GR called GR66A. And in Drosophila, you have a way to use this, uh, the promoter of this gustatory gene to express another gene. For example, a gene that is an apoptosis gene that kills the neuron. So you have a way to suppress all bitter sensitive uh, cells in an insect. And what happens? So let's take uh, one uh, toxic substance. It's L-canavanine. L-canavanine is a pseudo amino acid. And actually it's the, the substance which killed the hero in, uh, um, in the movie Into the Wild. You know this guy, uh, he goes to Alaska in a bus and then he's eating some uh, food. And he is mistaking the food, and actually he dies because of El Canaven. So this movie could never have been uh, uh, made with Drosophila, because for Drosophila, El Canavanin is bitter. And you see this when you give the Drosophila increasing concentration of El Canavanin, they eat less and less. And at 10 uh, millimolar, they don't eat El Canavanin at all, even it, if it is mixed with sugar. So if you take uh, these flies uh, and you make a genetic construction that kills, that expands uh, uh, DTI, which is a diphtery toxin into the, the neuron expressing GR66A, you get this. All individuals in which the bitter sensitive neurons have been killed, they don't detect alkanavanin at all uh, these concentrations. So it means it supports the idea that we have that Drosophila, and actually it's the same for us, that we have a taste system where the sensory cells say to the brain, this is good, this is bad. 
And if you kill the cells which say it's bad, then you eat toxic uh, molecule and you die. Well, this is nice, but it's not completely true. If you take another beta substance like uh, strychnine, you do the same experiment, you kill the sensory cells detecting bitter, uh, bitter uh, chemicals, and you see that these individuals, they still, they are still able to avoid strychnine. And we discovered that actually the bitter sensitive cells are killed. There is now no doubt about it. And what happens is that strychnine is interacting with the sugar sensitive neuron. Strychnine is inhibiting the sense of sugar. When you drink coffee, it's bitter, you add sugar and uh, it masks the bitterness. When insects are drinking strychnine, it masks sugar and they stop eating because it has no taste. So it means that what I said is previously is true, but you have two ways to detect bitter chemicals. One way is to detect them directly. And the other way is to design receptors to sugar, to appetitive substance, which might be altered, inhibited by the presence of bitter molecules. Okay, so there are two ways to detect bitter molecules. One way is the direct way, you activate a nerve cell. And when the nerve cell is excited, it tells to the brain, don't, don't go, it's bad. And the other way is to extinct, to, uh, to, to inhibit the, 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 the good signals. So that's, this summarizes what I just said. So you have two ways, inhibition and activation. Activation is that the, what most people are, are focusing on. We try to, to find uh, gustatory genes which are involved in the direct detection of uh, bitter chemicals. But this other inhibition mechanism is much less known. And there are only a few examples known. And actually not all substances have the same power of inhibition. So there is some specificity in the inhibition. And the, the, the main point of this discussion is to, to convince you that the taste system is a sensory system which helps animals to predict the value, the potential value of food. So it's a prediction. It's not a, a, a statement. When you detect sugars, it's a prediction that the, 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 the sugar will be nutritious. But some sugars are not nutritious because they are not digested. And some sugars have no taste, but they are digested. And it's the same for bitter. Some bitter chemicals are toxic. Some bitter molecules are not toxic. And there are uh, toxic molecules which are not bitter. Okay, so it's a prediction system. It's imperfect. And there is no reason why the, there should be perfection in this world at least in the world of taste. These bitter, uh, uh, these gustatory neurons are also evolving with a diet and they reflect the food habit. If you are a specialist, if in your food there is no bitter chemicals, like vampire bats, they are eating on, on blood, there is no bitter chemicals, they are losing the bitter chemicals. If you have a cat, you know that you, can, you, you don't, need to give your cat any sugar because cats are not detecting uh, sugars. If you have a dog, you know that they have a sugar receptor. So cats and many carnivorous animals have lost their gustatory receptor. And when you look at the uh, uh, polyphagous insects, uh, you see that they have more and more uh, gustatory receptor. And uh, people are working on Drosophila, they look at these systems because they, they are trying to correlate the evolution of the sensory system with the capacity of an insect to feed and use a toxic uh, uh, fruit or a, a, a new plant. And if you look at the number of gustatory and olfactory receptors in different 
species of insects, you see that there is a large range of uh, variation. The most specialized uh, insects, like uh, human louse, they have 10 olfactory receptors and six gustatory receptors. And uh, Blatella germanica, the cockroach, they have 123 olfactory receptors and 483 gustatory receptors. You imagine, we have 30 gustatory receptors. They have 483. Uh, Apis mellifera is uh, something, it uh, has many olfactory receptors and very few gustatory receptors. Uh, Drosophila melanogaster has about the same, 60, 66. Tribolium, 261, 219. Lepidoptera have about seven to 80 uh, olfactory receptors and 250 gustatory receptors. It means that gustation is really important for insects, much more than for us. Anyway, now we go to the main question and we try to look experimentally if there is a link between sensory detection and uh, toxicity. So we took a range of molecules, natural molecules, berberine, caffeine, nicotine, Essine and quinine. And we took also two uh, synthetic molecules, paraquat, which is often used in the Drosophila, Drosophila work uh, to uh, challenge uh, uh, Drosophila, and also denatonium benzoate, which is a bitter molecule, which is extremely bitter for us. You, uh, it's called Btrex in uh, the industrial work, and uh, uh, it is added to. Uh, uh, products that you have in your kitchen to avoid uh, that children eat uh, and, and die because they are ingesting uh, chemicals which are in your kitchen. So the most common way to test if chemicals are toxic to insect is to mix a, a chemical to the food and to observe how long uh, it takes for the animals to die. So as we, uh, in order to do that, we, we place uh, flies into a tube. There is food on one side mixed with chemical. And in the middle of the tube, there is a detector which is counting how many times the fly is crossing the, the, this point. So it's called the activity, locomotor activity detector. It's sold by tree kinetics and it's really nice because it allows you to do long-term experiments without having the need to go to the lab uh, during the weekend. <laughs> Wonderful. And what you see is that if you start with uh, 32 uh, flies, uh, you see that depending on the concentration of denatonium benzoate, for example, you see that it takes some time for the flies to, to die. This is the time in days, and this is the number of animals surviving. And the two, black curves uh, are two controls. The black curve uh, here is uh, agar mixed with sugar, 30 millimolar. And uh, this uh, curve is agar, no sugar. So if they have no food, they die quickly in two and a half days, all the population is, is killed. And if they have uh, 30 millimolar of sugar, uh, they, it takes them uh, 10 days. Actually, you, what you look at is at the time 50% of the population is dying, uh, because that's yeah, whatever. And what you see is that depending on the concentration, the more denatonium benzoate you are using, the quicker they, they die. So you, what can you... Uh, what conclusion can you draw from this data? It's just that denatonium benzoate uh, seems to be toxic, or that denatonium benzoate prevents insects from feeding and they die because they are hungry. And there is no way to know if denatonium is, is acting because it's aversive or because it's toxic. So we try to imagine another way to, to, to look at that. 
it's to inject the natonium benzoate, yes, into the, the abdomen. So you inject a, a dose of the natonium benzoate into the, the abdomen, and then uh, you do the same experiment. You, you put the insects into on, on, on sugar without the natonium uh, during uh, 30 days, and you see again that uh, there is a variable effect of, uh, of the natonium benzoate. And what you see is that uh, actually the, the, the range of those of denatonium needed to kill flies need to be much higher than previously. So you are tempted to say, okay, uh, it's because the natonium benzoate is not really toxic to the flies. But the point is that when you inject the chemical into the abdomen, you are bypassing uh, uh, the way uh, natural molecules are. So maybe the, the molecules are interacting with the digestive system and, and <laughs> you missed the point completely. So this experiment is nice, but it's not conclusive enough. So we try to bypass this by doing another uh, thing. We designed a system in which we can follow how much a fly is eating and how long the fly is living. So you take a webcam, you put the webcam into, in, in front of a cage. The cage is 3D designed so that you can uh, have flies uh, being maintained in individual cages. And each fly has access to two capillary tubes containing sugar mixed with water, mixed or not with uh, a bitter chemical. So you can, with this camera, you can uh, see if the fly is alive and how much it, it, it feeds. And uh, actually this is a movie. We take one image per minute. Here uh, on the left, we have, uh, yes, on the left we have sugar only, and on the right, we have a quinine at oh, one millimolar, I think. From this uh, movie, you can uh, follow the, the column of, each, of pixel over each uh, um, capillary, and you can extract what you see here. It's a chemograph. So here you have the time, and here you have uh, what is the, the, the column of pixel. And you see that the blue, uh, the level of the liquid is evolving uh, slowly when uh, on, on, on the left chemograph, but it's, it's going down very quickly on the right. <coughs> and actually, when there is sugar, the flies are eating. And when there is quinine mixed with sugar, they are not eating. So you extract curves, and then you can do statistics. And at the same time, you follow if the fly is moving, so you can have both information. So it's an improvement as compared to the previous experiment where uh, we were just uh, monitoring the, if the fly is alive or not. Okay. So what do we see? We see that if we uh, give uh, sugar on both sides, it's the same. Here we have two hours. Uh, uh, a two hours recording, we see that uh, flies are eating on, on both capillaries. There is no uh, bias to the left or to the right. And when you mix uh, 10 to the minus 4 molar concentration of phenine with the sugar, they avoid feeding on phenine. They eat a little bit, but they don't feed, uh, frankly, on phenine. And there is a dose dependent effect. That's what we see uh, here. Here we placed uh, quinine in both capillaries. So we have tested the, the, all the chemicals that we have seen, essine, nicotine, caffeine, paraquat, berberi, quinine, and denatonium. And what you see each point is the, the amount of liquid eaten by the fly during two hours. And we see that at the lowest concentration, they eat the same, but the more you add this uh, bitter molecule or toxic molecule, the less <coughs> you see, okay? So all these substances 
have an inhibitory effect on feeding in no choice condition. If you do a choice test, you place the quinine only on one side and sugar on, only on the other side, you see that the blue curve is the sugar only and the orange curve is the sugar mixed with a, a bitter chemical. And what you see, for example, denatonium, the more denatonium you are putting into the solution, the less they feed on denatonium and the more they feed on uh, sugar only. That's nice, but it's, it's, it's not the case for essine or nicotine. The more nicotine and the more essine you are adding, the less they feed on both solutions. So actually there are two ways uh, to avoid uh, uh, toxic chemicals. You see that for these uh, caffeine, paraquat, berberine, quinine, the total amount of liquid ether is almost the same. Well, if it's not good, they go to the other one. But for nicotine and essine, they stop feeding at all. So there are two ways to uh, avoid bitter chemicals. One is to avoid the bitter. The other one is to reduce consumption. And I don't know what's going on there. Uh, maybe it makes insects sick and they, they have no more appetite. Or they, they have difficulty to detect nicotine or essine. The second hypothesis is less likely because from electrophysiologic data, we know that the bitter uh, sensitive neurons are detecting uh, essine and nicotine. So my guess is that there is some post-ingestive effect that changed the way uh, insects interact with the food. So this is a, a short time essay, but if you do it on 10 days, by changing every two days the, the capillaries, the liquid into the capillary, you can do the same experiment that we have done previously. So we look at the survival time. So here the black curve, the same. This is no sugar, just water. This is uh, with 30 millimolar of sugar. And you see that there is a whole range uh, with just water, they, they die uh, after two days. If uh, uh, there is sugar, it takes uh, about six days for 50% of the population to die. And what we see here, uh, depending on the concentration of denatonium, there is an effect. But here we can also measure how much they, uh, they, um, they feed. And then we can compare the efficiency. Uh, we, we can also compare the efficiency of the, each molecule in these different uh, settings. So previously, on uh, the locomotion compensator, it's uh, graph A. You have uh, the concentration of chemicals, which are needed to kill 50% of the population after uh, two days, after three days. And the different colors shows you the, the, the concentration of the estimated concentration of each chemical needed to kill 50% of the population. So for example, the green dot on the left, it's denatonium. It means that uh, in order to kill 50% of the population uh, after three days, you need uh, point, between 0.1 and 0.2 uh, millimolar of denatonium. And the, the, the pink uh, dot on the right is for paraquat. You need two millimolar of paraquat to kill 50% of them. So if there is a, a, a relation between toxicity and bitterness, this range, this uh, uh, effect, range of effectiveness of each of uh, the, the chemicals should remain the same. Okay, so. Uh, Denatonium should always be the most effective and uh, uh, paraquat should be always the less effective molecule. So when you inject the chemicals, you see that paraquat is the most effective molecule. Whereas the less effective molecule is caffeine, is nicotine, sorry. And if you look at the result in the uh, uh, multi-cafe experiment, you see something uh, uh, 
almost similar to the first one. You see that uh, green, the most effective substance is the natonium, but the less effective substance is caffeine. So the relation I have postulated uh, in the first hypothesis that there is a relation between toxicity and, and bitterness does not seem to be very true. Okay, These, each experiment is different. The way of entry to the molecule into the insects may be different. So, okay. But this casts some doubt, doubts on, on the, the relation. Furthermore, since we have individual data, we, we, we can uh, try to, to look how much toxic molecule we need to ingest to, to die. So if there is a, a, we should see a, a, a relation between the amount of toxic molecule injection and uh, the speed of, uh, the, the length of the, the life of the insect. But the lowest concentration, for example, of the natonium, it's the, the cross in gray. You see that there is no relation. The natonium has no effect on the survivor at this concentration on, on these animals. When you, you take the, the, the blue one, it, I think it's, uh, it should be uh, 0.01 millimolar. There is no relation as well. There is a nice relation for 0.1 millimolar. And at the highest concentration, uh, they, they die uh, in the same range. If you do the same graph with the amount of sugar molecule, you see this. You see that there is a trend, but this is a nice relation between the amount of liquid or the amount of sugar molecule they eat and the length of the survival, not at the highest concentration, but nevertheless, uh, there is a nice relation. So there is a good correlation between the amount of liquid or sugar molecule with the duration of the life, but there's not such a good relation between the amount of toxic molecule ingested and uh, the length of the survival, which means that in this experiment, it suggests that the bitter effect is more prominent over the toxic effect. I'm almost done now. Uh, it's time to do a summary. Uh, so taste contact chemoreception is really an important search for insects. And I think that we, we would need more experiments to be done, more people working on taste, because there are a lot of things to be done. Insects have a lot of taste receptors, and amazingly, we are less, we are more concerned by olfaction than by taste. Aversive molecules are detected by two ways. There is a direct way, the way we, we think about it, it's aversive, it, it's, it has a direct effect on the neurons, but it has also an effect that inhibits the detection of good molecules. So if we go back to the two hypotheses I have uh, proposed, is toxic equivalent to bitter? No, there is no way. I don't think so. There are not many data in the literature on that. There are a few papers which also said the same. And I think that there is no direct relation between toxicity and bitterness. And uh, the second hypothesis, is there an antagonist relation between detoxification and bitterness? I don't think so. The data, the experiment data have shown you, do not allow me to conclude on that. So does bitterness predict toxicity? Not really. Bitter, uh, does it um, always induce a feeding inhibition? No, uh, there, are, uh, there are other uh, uh, experimental conditions in which we see that bitterness is used as a memory cue. Uh, we see also that bitterness induce uh, uh, behaviors we have not uh, studied here, like salivation, uh, producing of digestive enzymes, vomiting, or activating detoxification mechanisms. 
And actually, there are a few examples where bitterness is searched for. Some insects are searching specifically for uh, uh, bitter uh, chemicals because they are token stimuli. For example, they represent uh, the host plant. And there are a few papers where uh, people try to demonstrate that uh, insects which are sick are uh, feeding more on uh, bitter chemicals. So, if I were a plant, why would I produce a, a bitter chemical at all? And I think that plants are producing bitter chemicals to protect themselves, not to kill insects, but to tell insects that if they go for this plant, it might be dangerous. And I think that this addition, this combination of bitterness and toxicity, which are, I hope now you are convinced are separate, two separate mechanisms. I think that these bitter chemicals are serving as an aposematic uh, signal protecting the uh, toxic chemical. Let's say that we, you have a plant that produces an insecticide molecule only with no bit, uh, bitter, uh, with no sensory message. Then, you take a population of insects exposed to the toxin. It seems that there is one insect in red or two insects in red which are resistant to the toxin. So the next generation, these insects develop and, and then uh, the plant is done with the, the, the insecticide very quickly. It's the best way to, to kill your antibiotic or your resistant mechanism, not to advertise for it. On the contrary, if you associate a, a, a bitter chemical with the toxin, then the bitter chemical in green is preventing most insects from feeding on the plant. And so you reduce the, num the chance of resistant insects to be exposed to the toxin and to develop. So I think that bitter chemicals, they play an essential role in association with toxins. So if a plant were uh, producing only bitter chemicals, it will not never work. It's not a toxin because then uh, insects uh, may adapt behaviorally to it and then they, they feed on it. And good. if you take, if a plant is producing only uh, 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 an insecticide, it will not work. But the association of both uh, means is really important. So I'm finished, uh, thank you for your attention. I, I just want to conclude that bitterness is not directly to toxicity, uh, to uh, the limit of the experiment we have done. And most likely, I think that bitterness uh, is a warning signal. I want to thank all the co-workers and people who participated in this work and merci pour votre attention. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, thank you very much for, for this very interesting and didactic uh, presentation. I still learned, have learned, learned a lot. Also, I already had the opportunity to, to have some, to, to assist some talks from you. So thank you very much. Uh, I think we, we have some time for, for a few questions. Um, does anybody want to ask a question? Mathieu? I always have a case on taste and bitter. Uh, do you think that cyanogenic um, compounds can be both toxic and bitter? Would that be? Um, uh, cyanogenesis is bitter to us, uh, a compound which uh, release cyanide. The compound which break down and make cyanide, cyanure. Um, many insects which are toxic have a cyanogenic uh, glycoside. I wondered whether they could be both toxic and bitter. Oh. 
So my hearing is not very good. I will ask her first to repeat the question. Sorry. I'm not sure I understood very well the question, but uh, uh, do you think, uh, the question is, do you think uh, insects that are uh, uh, cytogenic, uh, uh, producing cyanide uh, are also bitter? The molecules are both bitter and toxic. Uh, yeah, so, um, yes, some chemicals can be bitter and toxic. And uh, yes, strychnine, for example, is bitter and toxic for us, but maybe not for uh, other animals. There are examples where uh, a substance is not toxic but bitter. One example is, is really striking, is, is something uh, that has been studied by in the, the lab of Kobe Schall. He works on uh, cockroach. And in cockroach, uh, people uh, try to, to kill cockroach by giving them uh, food, which contains an insecticide. And they have found in South America, uh, United States, cockroach which are resistant to this food. And I have discovered that these resistant cockroach are not resistant against the toxic, but because for them, glucose is aversive, is bitter. And actually, I have demonstrated that bitter sensitive cells have acquired to the detection of uh, glucose as a bitter substance. So it's, it's an, a case where those functions are completely dissociated. So naturally, if there is no insecticide in the environment, these cockroach have, the, the number of these cockroaches is, is low. But in an environment where the toxin is present, these cockroach, they strive and, and the other, they die. So I think that the two signals do not need to be associated. So do you think it, it's more effective? Have they need to be correlated. It's, it's, a, it's a sensory signal which allow a reliable prediction and it's acquired through evolution and maintained through evolution. If the correlation is failing, then all insects which for which the sensory system does not detect the, the they, they are okay. And, and they will develop. So I think that uh, bitterness is something that, that is acquired through evolution and also through memory, but all through evolution. And the main question that I'm wondering, the, the main question I see now is how fast this gustatory system is evolving? Because I'm working in an agronomical school. I'm concerned by crop protection. If I go to a farmer, I say, okay, use quinine or strychnine or berberine on your insect. How long will this defense last? It will, it will not last if quinine berberine is not toxic by itself, or if quinine or berberine is, as, uh, is associated with a really toxic molecule. So on Drosophila, we could do artificial evolution to test these hypotheses. Yes. Do individual slides learn to guess okay. about whether or not there is a link between bitter and toxic? Moi, mal, no? uh, do they yeah. learn Oh, sorry, I didn't <laughs> no, do I they learn? Do the do the individual flies learn yes. uh, whether there is an association between bitterness and toxicity? Oh, yeah. This I don't know. Uh, uh, most likely, yes. Uh, we worked on uh, on 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 honeybee with, with a colleague, and we see that they can associate uh, the the presence of a bitter chemical and post ingestive uh, uh, effect. This is not well known. Uh, there are not so many. The, 
What is most studies actually currently is that people uh, show that they can learn to associate uh, uh, um, nutritive reward and a stimulus, like uh, olfaction, like vision, like maybe taste. So they, they can learn the uh, post-ingestive effect, so intoxication. Uh, I, well, I, I don't see many papers in, on, on this. I would bet that they learn that it's, it's um, I told you that the sensory detection is imperfect. So you need to, to have a way to adapt and, and to, to, to the, the present condition. I was just wondering with your system um, observation, perhaps yeah, yeah. investigate that, take the same flies yes. again on secondary yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I would say I would answer yes, but actually I have no solid data to support my answer. Yes, Ad, I was wondering in the case where uh, where you let them choose between um, uh, bitter and the other, and they 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 eat nothing. Is it possible that uh, you have some? Remnants of the molecule or the yes. association with the receptor, such that they keep feeling, feeling yes, feeling, yes, feeling these states for long. It's a common experience when you, you eat something uh, uh, very bitter; the bitterness stays long in, in into your mouth. And we that's see, why I was asking because <laughs> we don't. see in electrophysiology that uh, uh, if you, I am doing a lot of electrophysiology. Uh, uh, there are some uh, methods by which you can look at what the neurons are, are doing after a stimulation. And some stimuli, they have a long lasting effect. So it's possible that the, uh, just one exposure to bitter chemicals may have a long effect and nicotine might be. And is it the possible same. that the molecule itself is not degraded and keeps That's st also, stuck on the. Yes. yes. The thing is that the sensory system uh, function because they have receptor, but they also they need to have enzymes to degrade uh, the molecule. Otherwise, it's like uh, in a synapse, it's constantly acting. So if there is no degradation, then the, the chemical is still acting. So that's another possibility. So it means that when we introduce new molecules into an environment, it's impossible to predict what they will do. If you introduce an insecticide, artificial insecticide into the environment, it's possible that this insecticide might be tasted as good. And, and actually there is one paper on uh, honeybee which suggests that uh, my, people, my colleagues in, in Toulouse, they don't believe this publication was, that has been published in Nature, but she claims uh, Geraldine Wright claims that uh, neonicotinoids are actually stimulating feeding of honeybees. And it's a good example of that, maybe neonicotinoids. They are activating the sugar sensing uh, 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 receptors. And it's only through evolution that uh, the, the species of honeybee could learn to avoid neonicotinoids. So if we have thought about that, we, hope we would have tried to design neonicotinoids either associated with a bitter molecule or with a function, like you suggested, that activates the bitter uh, uh, receptors. Yes. Last question. You mentioned that in agronomy, you could use uh, molecules that taste bitter to protect crops instead of toxic molecules. Do you think it, it might be harder for the insects to? Overcome not liking bitter and, and this I don't know. Yeah. Uh, so when people discover the bitter molecules, they call them antifeedants. They try to use them as insecticide. And uh, there was a lot of research uh, during 20 years about all bitter aversive molecules are uh, found in plants. And actually the all attempts failed because insects, when they are hungry, 
they care less about uh, bitter chemicals and, and they feel even it's bad. And so if the bitter chemicals are not associated with the toxin, it will never work. But I think that the association of the two lasts much longer than the use of only insecticide. And, and maybe we could use insecticide at a, a lower level also. So I think that too. combination of two would, would be mm -hmm. more stable, more resilient. You know, with antibiotics against a bacteria, there is no way to do that. You have to kill the, the, the bacteria or you, you die. But with insects, you can tell them, go away, go away. And you do this with bitter chemicals. And I think that the, the, the association of the two would be more efficient. That's my suggestion. But it needs to be proved uh, experimentally. There is no data supporting this prediction right now. Um, OK. I think, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Time is very, you know. <laughs> so, thank you very much for the, the different uh, uh, questions and answers. Uh, I think there are lots of, of things to be discussed further, but um, maybe you can discuss after um, the session and finish here. So, thank you again, Fred. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.